Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Seth McGowan. I'm the Vice President of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, and I'll be your host this evening. The Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory is proud to present the second presentation in the Cygnus series. This series of live, virtual, and interactive presentations are educational and will take place uh, each Friday night at 7 o'clock p.m., as we are tonight. We've developed the Cygnus series as a way of continuing our educational program and our educational mission during this period of social distancing and uh, limited gatherings. We hope to see you again in person soon, but until then, please register each week for a new and exciting program. In the same spirit, look for more information about live, virtual, and interactive stargazing in the coming week broadcasting from our very own roll-off roof of Dervatory right here in Tupper Lake in the heart of the Adirondacks. For those of you who might be new to the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, you'll notice our location is perfectly suited for astronomy given our class four boreal skies, but it doesn't stop there. The Astro Science Center is currently under development and will become an important destination for all ages in the future. The numerous interactive exhibits within the museum will educate and thrill visitors as we Earth beings continue our exploration into space. In addition to the exhibit hall and continuing our hands-on approach to astronomy is the Makerspace classroom where visitors will engage in virtual reality, telescope making, and much, much more. Our lecture hall would be a great place for larger groups to hear about the wonders of space and our premier planetarium will take you on trips beyond your wildest imagination. We invite you to be part of this exciting future by becoming a member of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory and consider a gift to help make the Astro Science Center a reality by clicking on the link on our website. And now on for the show. Before we begin, you'll notice that your microphones are muted upon entry. This is to ensure the enjoyment of uh, all who are with us tonight. Feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions during the lecture. If your question is not answered during the presentation, a question and answer period will take place immediately following where you'll have the opportunity to be unmuted and ask your questions directly. Tonight's presentation, as well as all future talks, will be available the following day on our YouTube channel. You'll be provided with the links referred to tonight in the chat area at some point during the presentation. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eileen O'Donohue, Henry Priest Professor of Physics from the Physics Department of St. Lawrence University, and more importantly for us, the board, a board member of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, to give us the inside scoop of Einstein, gravity, and multi-messenger astronomy in a three-part series. You'll notice that tonight is part one, Einstein. Uh, you'll be notified that uh, the second part of gra uh, gravity will be on September 11th on uh, Friday. And on Friday, October 9th, the final part in the series, Multi-Messenger Astronomy, will take place. So now, without any further ado, Eileen, take it away. All right. Well, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, start screen share. Yes. Okay. And so, <clears throat> get my PowerPoint to come up. All right. So, um, uh, this, uh, yeah is a talk I've been developing for a while, and particularly when we have the eclipse in 2017 and the eclipse that's coming in 2024, where we will be in totality here in the North Country. Uh, and I'll show you that in the third one. So you have to keep coming back. Uh, so this uh, series of talks, in, in normal times, I'd give it as, you know, an hour long uh, lecture in person, but Online, it's harder to hang out for that long. So we've broken it up into three. And uh, you can, uh, we'll have the uh, recordings posted. So today, part one is Einstein. And really what I'm gonna do is contrast Einstein's universe and Newton's universe. And then this conclusion that Einstein's uh, 
theory came to that space time is a fabric or, or really more fluid because it's in three dimension and it ripples. Um, and then part two is about gravity and really gravitational waves, these ripples in space time and how we detect them with an instrument called LIGO. And that'll be uh, part two. And then a part three, I'll actually talk about the detections and why particularly the second one led to what we're now calling multi-messenger astronomy and why we call it multi-messenger uh, astronomy. And that's essentially because now we have gravitational waves as well as electromagnetic waves. So this is the whole series. Um, so today I'm just going to do um, Einstein. And so uh, let me start by reminding you about Newton's universe. So in Newton's universe, space and time are independent, they're static. Nothing alters the dimensions of space. Nothing alters the flow of time. And so they're just set. And matter and energy are distinct and independent things. They're separate. A rock is matter. It can be weighed. It could be melted or vaporized, but it remains stuff. Uh, it can have energy, but it can't be energy. If you raise up a rock, it gains potential energy that if you drop it, it gains kinetic energy, which it can then change into uh, chemical energies that breaks your toe and uh, makes you jump up and down. So it gives you kinetic energy. Uh, so these are separate things though. One, energy can't become matter. Matter can't become energy. In Einstein's universe, space and time are not independent. They're knitted together in an entity called space-time. It's even one word now. Both are altered by motion, the observer's motion, and both are altered by gravity. So, and the other uh, remarkable thing is that matter and energy are actually the same stuff. They're different forms of the same stuff. Matter can become energy. Stars shine by doing this. If here in Potsdam, I can still see a few rays of, of sunlight. To provide that sunlight, the sun every second fuses 45 e mass, uh, hydrogen mass equivalents of Einstein class aircraft carriers. That much mass of hydrogen, 45 of those every second that becomes the sunlight that I see shining on the trees out here. Utterly amazing. That is, that energy comes from matter. It was matter, now it's energy. Energy can become matter. Mostly this happened in the early universe. Uh, and so what this comes to, what this results in is his famous equation, E equals MC squared. So the E is energy equals is, M is mass, matter, you got to multiply it by the speed of light squared. Well, what's so special about the speed of light? That seems kind of bizarre. Well, let's look at a way to think of the speed of light. So in Einstein's universe, there are these symmetries. Matter and energy are different forms of the same stuff. They're related by E equals MC squared. Space and time are both constructs of this universe. The way I think of it is that they kind of provide a grid, a scaffolding, where matter and energy interact. Matter and energy also interact with space and time. So they warp the, the structure, but still it's like space and time are the structure. And what is this silly C squared thing in here? Well, one of the ways we can think about it is that it's kind of a unit conversion. So here I've got a usual three-dimensional grid that you probably drew somewhere in junior high or high school and you had to plot things on it. Well, let's have, and actually we live in this grid, and usually 
we, you know, in the corner of my room, I can imagine a vertical axis, a, a side ways axis, and an axis that comes out toward me. And they're all measured in meters or feet or miles. Um, and, but I'm also, I also have a time axis. And the way that we detect the time axis is that it's dragging us into the future at one second per second, whether we want to go or not. And actually, at my age, I think it drags me into the future at one minute per second. And so um, it accelerates. Uh, and uh, so anyway, so what I've done here is I'm going to turn that, 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 that uh, grid I have in the corner, I'm going to turn it 90 degrees so that now I'm going to see that time axis. So the up and down and the coming out at us, those are measured in space. In, 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 those are space. Those are measured in meters or miles or feet, whatever you want. I'm using meters because I'm a scientist and we use the metric system. So, and then we're measuring time in seconds. And so if you're going to draw something accurately on this grid, you know that, well, you need to know how many meters there are in a second. So how many meters are there in a second? Well, there's three times 10 to the eighth meters in a second. Or if you want to use the American system, 186,000 miles in a second. Wow. Seconds are really big units compared to meters, and which is something, an indication about the universe in itself. But that's a way you can think about it. It's not the way, but it is a way why this matters, why the speed of light is what matters. Uh, so that's Einstein's universe. But there's also a supersymmetry that we suspect and that we have hints of that actually matter, energy, and space-time are actually all the same stuff. And we don't know how to put them together. And that's, that's, that's a problem for physicists. We're struggling with this. And when you have a problem, of course, we all been to therapy, you know, you have to name it. So we've named it quantum foam. It's, it, it, and, and to try and visualize what this is, this is like, so you've got this scaffolding, these naked eye beams of the universe and matter and energy are doing their things. They're making stars and planets and puppies and being busy. And now you, you squish it all together so that the, the scaffolding and the stuff are all the same. And we don't know how to write down the physics because if you squish time and space into stuff, how do you write down a, an equation with X, distance and t time. The, the, explaining the physics of this quantum foam is, is a real challenge and it's not one I'm taking up. I observe the galaxies. I don't try to figure this out, but I do try to explain it a little bit. So that's what we're looking at. This quantum foam is the same stuff that we believe lurks in the centers of black holes, where matter gets so dense that it, it, it gets, it, that it actually, the density goes to infinity because the radius goes to zero. We don't know the physics. Working on it. Very smart people are working on it. It's a tough nut to crack them. All right. So space and time in Newton's universe. Gravity is an attractive force between mass and bodies. This is not an exact quote. He, he was thinking this in 1687. It works really well. We use Newtonian physics to get new horizons out to Pluto and beyond. Newton's laws are really powerful. With Newton's laws, we figured out the, you know, the, the, we figure out the masses of stars that are orbiting each other. We can do great stuff with Newton's physics. So it's not that it, it, it wasn't like replaced by Einstein's universe. It's just Einstein's view extends what we can see. Space-time and Einstein is that mass tells space how to curve and space tells mass how to move. And the classic model is that a mass, a big mass like the sun, that it kind of, you know, the, the classic model of it is you have a, a, an elastic sheet stretched out and you roll a, it's taut, and you roll a bowling ball onto it. 
and it makes a, a, a warp. And then if you roll a marble toward the bowling ball, as it shows here on this uh, slide, that the marble will roll around the bowling ball because it's warped. Or, you know, if you don't have a stretched sheet and a bowling ball, you can just go into Walmart and run your quarter down that little, uh, uh, the thing they have for charity where it rolls around that big V, that big funnel into the bottom. And it's quite cool. And it's a nice model uh, for Einstein's universe. Um, except we don't know where the hole in the bottom goes. So it's not just this. The other thing, the other element of, of this, it's space time. It's just not warping space. Mass tells time how to flow. Gravity slows time. All right. And those of us who live in the Adirondacks experience this. Because, you know, when you go to the mountains, <laughs> time goes, it just goes by so much more quickly. So actually, no, that's not a quantum, that's not a special relativity effect, but uh, it's always nice to relate to our experience. But we, this is true. And actually our GPS satellites have to account for this, that where they are a few hundred uh, kilometers above the surface of the earth, time flows more slowly for, or faster for them than it does here on earth. We have to do the correction that Einstein taught us between how fast their clocks run and how slow our clocks run so that we get accurate measurements. Without that, our, our, your GPS would have you in the wrong village. So it's very important uh, that we take this into account. So it's real. There's lots of evidence that this stuff that Einstein said is is real and we can measure it. Eileen, we have a question from uh, David Bradford. Okay. Want to ask your question. Oh, so I do it live, okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought they did have to use general relativity for some of the uh, farther flung missions. Oh yeah, they, uh, yeah, they probably have, but it's primarily, Newton has done a lot to get us out there. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, because, it, it, well, special relativity too, because they're running. But uh, there's still that uh, Newton's laws still give us the basics. Okay, so they like they sort of do it as an add-on. Like, well, I was thinking of uh, what was it? Some well, was it both the Voyagers that went around Venus, did a gravitational boost? Uh huh. And I thought they would need relativity for uh, for that to do that correctly. But maybe not. I, I, I don't know the details of that. I'd have to look into right. it. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was uh, thinking that that was really pretty Newtonian, but okay. I'll look into it and see if they needed to use the relativistic effects. So, sorry, I can't answer that more accurately. Thanks. More confidently. I try and answer it in my next one or on a blog or something. Okay, so. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to point out about this drawing is that uh, you, you really need to draw it in three dimensions, but I can't draw that in three dimensions. So we use a two-dimensional model just because, I mean, I can draw three dimensions on a two-dimensional screen, but drawing four is just beyond most of what we can do. All right. So what is a practical effect? And why did some of the, the title originally have eclipses and I changed it to gravity? Um, so space uh, also, as well as telling mass how to move, it tells light how to bend. And this was revolutionary. So, and Einstein said that the positions of stars seem to change on the far side of the sun. And so here is a light ray from a star in Newton's universe. Just goes right by the sun, doesn't notice it, and just goes straight. In Einstein's universe, the, the, the uh, um, remember, the sun is a big mass, it's warping space-time, so space-time is curved, and so the light ray follows that curve. And so the light ray, light ray curves around the sun in um, Einstein's universe, and we convinced that uh, light goes straight, follow that right light ray back, and we say, that's where the star is. And so 
that's it's it's the apparent position of a star visible during the eclipse it stars behind the sun always have their positions warped their positions move outward from the sun but we can't see them because the sun's too bright so we had to wait for an eclipse and in 1919 uh Arthur Eddington, all these as astronomers fanned out all over the globe to look at this total solar eclipse, to try to spot stars right close to the sun and measure their positions because we've been mapping this guy for 5,000 years. We know the positions of the stars really accurately. And so if their position changes when they're, they appear close to the sun during an eclipse, we're gonna be able to measure it. And so Arthur Eddington did indeed measure it. And here he indicated the stars whose positions were deflected just as Einstein had predicted. This was a triumph of this theory. There's something real here. These stars are not appearing where they should because the light is bending around the sun. So, space is this fabric or fluid. It's something, not nothing. I remember as a kid kind of trying to figure out if the air was something or nothing, and it's definitely a something. But empty space is a something? That's, wow. Okay, that's, that's, that's a very different thing to think. And then he said that, that gravis, gravitational disturbances should be able to propagate in this fabric or this fluid. So gravitational waves, they're longitudinal waves. They're like, they're like waves on a slinky where you, you stretch it out and then you grab a bunch of coils and you let it go and it goes zipping back and forth. That's compressional waves, like sound waves. These things that are whacking you in the, in the eardrum that are helping you to hear my voice. Those kind of waves, not the ripply waves on the surface of a fluid, but the ones within the fluid that are compressional. And so these gravitational waves will move at the speed of light, uh, uh, 300,000 km kilometers per second or 186,000 miles per second. It's the fabric of space contracting and expanding. And nothing reflects or absorbs or refracts them. They just keep going. And so their shape, like the shape of the sound waves that are coming to your ear that makes me sound like Eileen instead of Seth, uh, these, uh, they reflect like the structure of my mouth and my throat. You hear my voice. Well, the same thing is that gravity waves are shaped by the physics that creates them. And by the theorists can look at that and, and figure out, okay, if we have the merger of two black holes, what that ripple gonna look like? And so the conclusion is space-time ripples. Can we detect the ripples? That's our big question. And that's what I'm gonna talk about in the second one. So what, was it, what does it look like if uh, space-time ripples the Earth? Well, this is a uh, video from uh, LIGO. The scale is vastly exaggerated, but what, let's see what this would look like, this compression and expansion hitting the Earth. And so it's actually going to warp it. And what this is, is actually every meter stick on Earth is changing length there. And that's really exaggerated. And we'll talk about how exaggerated it is next time. I mean, but that's what we're looking for. We've got a question from Ralph. Okay. Ralph, you should be able to unmute. Okay, hello, can you hear Hi. me? Hi. Uh, yeah, my question is, if we're looking at space-time like a fluid, how is that different from the ether that they used to propose and then end of the you know 1900s right maybe they were on to something <laughs> <laughs> but uh it doesn't uh, what uh, and the the experiment they used they said well if we're in an ether 
then it's going to be like the wind and it's kind of like going to blow the speed. The speed of light with the ether is going to be different from the speed of light against the ether. Awesome. And that is not true. Okay. So it's, it's different from the ether. It doesn't affect the speed of light. The speed of light doesn't add or subtract. And, and, and also, though we're moving through space time, the effects are different from just what they were sampling. But yes, there is a lot that does sound like the ether. And uh, I suppose we could get into very deep philosophical discussions, particularly over yeah. wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. so that's a very good insight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, thank you. Eileen, I just want to mention that uh, I, I much appreciate the, the note at the bottom of that slide that's at the scale of effect vastly exaggerated. I was getting nervous there for a minute. Oh, yeah. No, we're not going to be able to notice it. I mean, I'd be a little taller for a few seconds if it happened. All right. Oh, I didn't mean to run that again. I wanted to uh, just say, how can we detect the ripples? This has been the challenge since 1919 you know, or actually since Einstein came out of his theory and we said there's something real, well, how do we t detect gravitational waves? And so the adventure continues. And I'll talk about that in my next segment uh, on uh, September 11th. So you have to wait until then, but uh, this uh, probably will have the slides somewhere on the ADK or in the, excuse me, on the uh, ASCO, learning a new logo um, website, and you'll have the YouTube you can look at. So let's just open it up to questions and comments. All right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, allow participants to unmute themselves. Um, and I would uh, ask for some civility if, uh, if possible. And uh, once you've asked your question, uh, you can mute yourself back again. So here goes a little social experiment for us here. Everyone now has the capability to be unmuted. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, simply just chime in. Or just in. make a comment. Yeah. Or a correction, that's, that's fine too. <laughs> so Christian, did they, did they use GR or uh, special relativity with the probes, do you know? Yep, you got to unmute. <laughs> yep. Oh, well, they can't. Oh, yeah, that. yeah. No, oh, so, yes, I am not sure either. Um, I'd be surprised. I think those effects would be relatively small. So I think to go to be. For a Venus mission, or even to do slightly, Voyagers. yeah. But I, again, I'm not sure. I don't know about it. Yeah, I uh, Christian is a theoretical cosmologist who's on our faculty at St. Lawrence. Yeah, that's the problem. That I'm a theorist. So yeah, yeah. So Meg, yes, unmute and ask your question. Can you not unmute? I pinged on, uh, um, let's see. I'm, uh, I, there we go. I am right. did. <laughs> Hi, I'm Meg Thatcher. I'm, I'm uh, zooming in from West Springfield, but I'll be in the Adirondacks in a, in a week. And I teach astronomy at Smith College. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and, and when, um, when someone asked that question, I actually went and quickly Googled and found a little article that said uh, they actually did measure it when they did the Apollo missions. And there was a difference in the trip between um, the, the two clocks, one that had gone down to the moon, or, or sorry, the one on Earth and the one that had gone around the moon. And the difference was 1.3 microseconds during the trip, of, which I think was like a week. Yeah. So it's a tiny, tiny, tiny effect. So, so they've confirmed it. I think they've also confirmed that uh, with planes just flying around the the uh, Earth. Absolutely, and that yeah. it's it's and, still a tiny effect, but yeah. it makes a difference when you're making measurements in the GPS. Yeah, yeah. So I I don't think they necessarily had to use it for the probes, but it's definitely measurable. Yeah. 
other questions, comments? If you're having trouble unmuting yourself for any reason, uh, just send me a quick uh, message through the chat and uh, I will try to unmute you from here. Zoom says that you have the ability to unmute yourselves now, but I don't believe anybody with the first letter of their name that starts with Z, so. Yep. Oh, okay, David. All right, I'm gonna unmute David or ask him to unmute himself. Oh, thank you, thank you. Hey, hi Seth, long time. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, I should, anyway, um, just uh, wet people's whistle for next time. A little bit about LIDAR in terms of um, what, what's the, um, like when did it get started and, and just, um, they've done some amazingly growth in their sensitivity. How did that happen? Um, they've been going at it for like 40 years or 50 years. Um, and uh, they started uh, trying to detect gravitational waves using an aluminum cylinder back in the 60s. And it just wasn't big enough because the effect is too small. So they've been through, I mean, NSF has been funding LIGO, L-I-G-O, and it's the Laser Interferometry um, Gravity Observatory, uh, some variations. And uh, so they have officially, I'm just bringing up um, the uh, talk I'm going to give. Uh, and uh, so uh, Joseph Weber tried to measure the effects with um, these aluminum bars. Uh, he thought in 69 and 70 that he had detected a gravitational wave. And then LIGO, I guess I don't have the years uh, for uh, LIGO, um, but Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, and it's literally been funded since the early 80s, and they had just upgraded it before they made the detection in 2015. So they really increased the sensitivity, and oh, part of what I'll talk about is how they increase that sensitivity because the biggest problem is that what they're trying to do is measure a variation in the distance basically between two mirrors and so how would they do that well i'll i'll explain how they do it with a, a laser beam but the it's such a small distance and if you just hang a couple of mirrors, they vibrate all the time because you get earthquakes, you know, you have a truck rumble by, um, at LIGO, they have these underground uh, tubes, you know, the staff goes jogging above them and they jiggle enough that it could look like a gravitational wave. So, so the sensitivity, uh, they've just gotten smarter and smarter and our computers are better and better. And they finally got it sensitive enough to detect this huge event of two black holes merging. Okay, they're not gonna, you know, detect a flea landing on a black hole yet. <laughs> Thank you, I don't wanna steal next next show, but yeah, so it was just from 215, or 2015, yeah, a lot of, a lot of stuff. Yeah, they had just come out of the upgrade. While we're waiting for the next comment or question, uh, you'll notice I posted a couple of links uh, to our website, adirondackskycenter.org, our Facebook page, and perhaps the most important is a place where you can uh, submit for a donation uh, to help us towards our goal of the Adirondack Sky, Sky Center completion. So feel free to visit those. A little earlier, I posted our YouTube channel link. Uh, those are there, feel free to uh, scroll back up and copy those someplace. The chat will also be available tomorrow along with the video. Although the chat, I don't know if you've seen Zoom chats, but they're uh, fairly uh, text looking, not as, not as friendly as they are in the nice little window. More comments, questions?
as an added bonus to being here tonight, um, I just sent you the registration, the early registration link. Uh, you get a, uh, a, a discount for registering early for next week's uh, talk by Josh Thomas from Clarkson on uh, uh, spectroscopy. Sorry. <laughs> I'll try that a couple more times and it's not going to come out right anyway. It's one of those words I just can't say for some reason. But uh, he'll be here uh, same time, same place next week. Um, and there is the link that won't go out to the public until Monday. So you get an early shot at registration and that handy discount. <laughs> We're here for any more questions or comments. We can, we'll be here all night if the questions keep coming. If not, uh, and uh, it's uh, easy to find my uh, email at St. Lawrence. Uh, so just go to the physics department faculty, and uh, there's a I, there's a link to my email. So if you come up with questions, you want to ask something, feel free to do that. We can have a private Zoom. Maybe the cats will join. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't seen a tail here tonight. <laughs> we have a couple of applause icons going on. Um, Yay! Well, thank you, everyone. I mean, good grief, there are 30. There were 38 people a minute ago uh, zoomed into this. So thank you all uh, for your attention and for you know it's a lovely Friday night. What are you people doing sitting here in front of Zoom? Yeah. So I hope you can get a glimpse of the sky tonight. It's getting dark a little earlier, so we can all see some stars. I don't see stars for the entire month of July. I just can't stay up late enough. <laughs> I also want to mention that although we're not doing live stargazing at the, uh, or in-person stargazing at the Roloff Roof Observatory in Tupper Lake, we are on the verge of uh, doing that virtually live. We have a, um, a Mellencamp camera set up connected to a Celestron 14 inch and you'll be able to see uh, a feed of what the Celestron is looking at right through that telescope. So we'll be launching that within the next week or so. Just so now we need another comet. Yes, that would be perfect. Well, and we'll be able to look at uh, Jupiter and Saturn pretty oh, soon. And, and other uh, deep sky objects. Uh, we've looked at the fireworks galaxy last night and uh, uh, the Ring Nebula and the Dumbbell Nebula that uh, Jeff talked about last week. So uh, that was a lot. It, it, it's going to be fun. Cool. All right. Thanks, All right. Daniel. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Happy. Thanks, Sunday. everyone. And thank you, Eileen. Great. I'm happy to do it, you know. It's a lot of fun for me, particularly because I don't have to give quizzes or grades. <laughs> Even better. <laughs>